I've been working in Amazon for a long time and uh, done a number of projects there, but for um, more than 40 years now, my uh, focus geographically at any rate has been this southeastern corner of Peru, in Cusco Madre Dios, where um, I've run a research station um, in the Manu National Park. And uh, so when uh, it, it suddenly uh, evolved that I was going to pitch it to Scott Robinson today. Um, I thought about various topics and uh, with Betty's encouragement that it ought to have a Florida flavor, uh, the best I could do, I'm afraid, is go back about 30 years and got the graduate student. And uh, I, uh, I regret that I don't have a picture of Scott and he was graduate student. He looked a little different then. Um, those are the days film cameras, and now everything's digitized. I don't have digitized picture of Scott in his early days. So um, I am going to talk about birds, and I see John Blake is going to also talk about birds. So I hope we don't. Uh, uh, I think that mouse is really hard to move. Okay, I don't know what, what I'm supposed do to do here. Down the yeah. Or just a yeah, cursor key. That's going to yeah, work okay, better. Now, something happened here. So if you just try to click, on, if you can. <laughs> Also, it's slightly like it or like uh, you can get rid of that thing. I don't know. Maybe you know how to get rid of it. Uh, I think you have to just click here. Okay, well, all right. Uh, thank you. Let's see if it's for the night. It is. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, here's a slight close up of it. You know, Peru is desert on the coast and very high elevations and mountains. And uh, over here on the eastern side, Peru has done a great job of creating protected areas. You see there's a park here and then there's Park Manu and there's Otishi and then there are reserves. Um, a very substantial portion of the uh, landscape in southeastern Peru is uh, under some form or another of protection. Some of it is for indigenous people. And, um, but there, as you see, there's several parks and uh, that creates a very ideal situation for a uh, research station because uh, there's one thing a research needs, especially long-term research, is stability. And without the protection of a park, um, stability just isn't there. As, as, as someone described earlier, going back, yeah, finding your whole forest cut down, well, you don't need that kind of thing. You've got decades-long research projects running. So I ran this field, a field station a long time, and uh, this is where Scott did his uh, dissertation, and Bob Holt, who's also here, has been site. And I thought, Betty, you'd be interested because uh, I know you've been going to Tupini, and you, I don't think I've ever seen the, the facilities at Cashew, but we have a, um, a building on the left here that's uh, offices, essentially, with a, a library, and then we have sort of a general purpose building with workshop and storerooms and a, and a non-science library in this little bit of it. And there's our dining hall with the tents. Those are for overflow crowds when there's too many people to fit inside. It does happen for a month or two, some years. And then we have a, a greenhouse. So that's a pretty much the basic uh, facilities there. Um, the uh, station is at a place called Kotrakashu, which means Lake uh, Cashew. Uh, as in cashew nuts. Um, and so this is when I look out of my office window, this is the scene I, I, uh, I can appreciate and see we have um, solar power that um, provides for uh, most of our needs. In fact, we first installed the first solar uh, back in the mid 1980s. It wasn't very common in those days. And since 1999, we've had internet. So uh, I think we have a leg up on a lot of other Bill station. So, um, all right, I'm going to be talking about bird distributions on a, on a landscape scale. And uh, here you can get a sense of that from this aerial view. I don't know how well you can see that up at the very top. Most of it covered up by that black strip. There is a thin line you can see very distantly through the haze. Those are the Andes. And so the environment that I'll be talking about is at the base of the Andes to the east. Um, and it is a, a sedimentary landscape that is filled up with thousands and thousands of meters of accumulated um, 
sediments that have rose, uh, uh, rose, eroded out of the uh, Andes. So it's uh, it's a high fertility zone, uh, supports high biomass forests and high productivity in general, and uh, along with that, uh, very good uh, densities of uh, mammals and birds. And um, the context I'll be developing is, is the, uh, the mosaic nature of the landscape and it's uh, a very considerable dynamism thanks to the meandering of, of uh, the uh, rivers that, that drain the entire region. You see these rivers um, form these meander curves, they're called point bars, geological terminology, but the, uh, in the flood season the, the bends of road on the outer edge and they deposit new land on the inner edge so that these tones develop out and you can see that the vegetation on these is, is young because the, the land itself is young. And back here is old forest, but this began about there. And you can see another one of these things here. Um, and uh, it's very clear in this uh, radar image. It's, uh, I love these radar images because they show the, uh, the habitat features very, very clearly. This blue is mature. Uh, floodplain forest, that would be the main context. The, the research station is right there on that lake. Uh, but then there you can see many other th uh, features here. These are the yellow and blue re represent different wavelengths uh, um, reflected in this radar of three, three wavelength uh, radar diagram. The red are palm swamps and these um, uh, topographically more complicated zones are uplands that have uh, been eroding into little micro uh, watersheds for a long, long time. To the north of the river, uh, the, the scene is predominantly yellow. That's because the forest is undergrown with bamboo. It's a bamboo forest. They extend for thousands of square kilometers and, and uh, are very, very prominent in the state of Acre, which is just north of here. And, uh, but south of the river, there are some patches of bamboo on these fossil floodplains, but mostly no bamboo there. So it's extremely heterogeneous. And uh, Scott and I spent quite a few years studying the, how birds are distributed in this, in this whole landscape. Well, here's just a, a closer up view of the, of the uh, station. It's, it's uh, a trail system. The buildings are right there. And it's, uh, it's on the Cochacashu, the river is the snaky thing. Here's another lake and another old uh, arm of the river that's uh, long since built in. So again, you can see that the, uh, the heterogeneity in the landscape as, as indicated. And again, another point bar with very early vegetation here, older and older vegetation. This is called the chrono sequence and back into mature forest. And so we're going to be talking about how birds distribute themselves from the open beach here in through this gradient of, of forest age, structure, and diversity um, uh, into the end of the mature forest. Uh, if you look at it, uh, we just looked at it from above, if you look at it horizontally, um, here's the youngest vegetation in one of these successional sequences. Uh, slightly older vegetation, older, older. You can see it's just like bleachers stepped up because plants grow. Um, uh, they start growing at different times as, uh, as the land um, develops outward. And so you get these different heights of vegetation um, in a sort of zone pattern. Okay. Uh, one of these uh, intermediate successional stages is, is uh, what we call cane breaks. And I uh, just want to show a picture of them because I'll come back and talk about that. You can see this is grass, it's about eight to 10 meters tall. Here's my companion there. You can see how big that, big those canes are compared to human. And the end point of the, of the uh, development of vegetation on these um, point bars. This is a mature forest, which you can see is structurally compli complicated. There are little trees, medium trees, somewhat bigger trees, very big trees. It's all uh, vertically structured, so it's an extremely complicated environment. And this is where the, the highest level of diversity of almost everything in this landscape occurs. It's in the, it's in the mature phase of the forest. Well, way back in 1982, we did a um, 
a major census of about 120 hectares. And this is sort of a schematic map of it. It goes between the lake and the river. It includes lots of that mature forest. Now, this was, uh, this was to test some ideas that were um, in the literature at the time about, uh, about what's called alpha diversity in bird communities. And the problem then was that uh, people had been studying tropical bird communities in various parts of the world, but uh, I liken it to studying an elephant hand lens. You go up to an elephant with hand lens and look, what do you see? Well, you see this sort of wrinkled skin and occasional hair sticking out. You have no idea. You're looking at an elephant. And that was a problem because they were using temperate zone method to study this incredibly diverse tropical bird community with very different properties. And they were getting all kinds of wrong impressions out of it. They were using two hectare sampling plots to study something in which the bird with the smallest territory is, is about five hectares. So it's a complete disconnect between the methods and what they were studying. So this uh, inspired us to do it on this much larger scale of about 120 hectares. Okay, but there's, there's a lot of detail here I'm going to skip over, but we uh, use a lot of methods to, to, to uh, detect and quantify the birds in this, um, in this space, um, and we did it but the main method was something called spot mapping. You hear a, a bird singing its territorial song. Uh, you know your position on one of these trails. Uh, you know what the bird is to the left or the right. You estimate how far it is, and then you you can fix that point on the map. So you know you have an idea. You estimate where where that bird was when it sung. Now these trails are 200 meters apart. And uh, that was because we found that we could detect all but two species of birds um, at at least 100 meters distance. So the center of these blocks is, is maximum 100 meters from the trails on either side. So we could detect all the birds. I'd say there were two we couldn't detect when we worked with those other ways. They just have very soft voices so we couldn't hear them. Um, so that's the trail system was constructed uh, to to do this uh, census. Uh, earlier today, there was another picture, something like this, and I was just put it in to, to point out that diversity here is very high. These this is a plate out of the birds of Venezuela, and 25 species of birds in single family, so-called ant birds, or Koreans, and at our site in Cashew. There are 54 species in just this family, only in this family. So more than twice as many as all of these in that one family. So it's a very, very diverse bird community. Uh, well, we uh, here is here is uh, the, the basic result in terms of mapping diversity. Uh, the, the only of 10 to 50 species in these zones, very close to the river. Uh, and then more and more species as you go into the older vegetation, as I showed. And then here is the, uh, the old growth mature forest. Um, and uh, that's up to uh, 130, 100, yeah, 150 species just up at the top there. Um, and that, that number is produced by mapping the territories of all the species in the community, about 230 of them. And then in the computer, just superimposing territories, and as it were, sticking a needle down through the superimposed stack of virtual territories and counting the number of territories that were penetrated by the needle. And that goes up to maximum about 150. But that's only territorial species. There are a lot of species that, are, that, that don't defend regular spatial boundaries, but non-territorial parrots, hummingbirds, all sorts of mannequins, other things. There are at least 50 of those. So the, the diversity in this high, uh, this uh, mature forest so is, is around 200 species at each point, uh, at any point determined in this way I just described. And uh, the most temperate forest might be 20, 30. So it's 
approximately 10 times the diversity of temperate forests. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's because they're not any more individual birds. The total number, the density of individual birds is about the same as in the temperate forest. It's just that there are a lot more species. The temperate forest, you have lots of individuals of a few species. Here you have few individuals, many, many, many species. It, it's organized in a completely opposite way. So there are about 10 times as many species in this. And their spatial requirements are very large. I mentioned the smallest territory is about four or five hectares, and the, the, the biggest territories go up to 100. Uh, the things like raptors require lots of space. So, okay, how, uh, um, I see. Okay, I'm the very quick, I got five minutes? I think I can do some five minutes. Okay, I'll just one little bit of the science, one little bit of the science. Or things. <clears throat> One of the things we wanted to know was what was regulating the, the change in composition of species as you go from the beach through the successional vegetation into the old growth forest. And uh, one pair of birds that showed that pattern very clearly with these two on the top is a thing called Marmoborus leucophries, and here is its very close relative, Marmoborus myotorinus. When we map their territories, we got these results. Uh, each one of these dots is, is a point I've determined that the way I've described. <clears throat> and for Myotharinus, uh, you see that the um, territories fill out practically all the space in the, in the um, study plot. They were very common bird. And uh, <clears throat> um, there's a process for determining uh, where the territory boundaries are. We, I don't have time to go into that. So here's the other species, this Leucophrys. It lives in the cane rates down near the river. <coughs> and what you see is that there's no overlap. The, the one species is on one side of this line, and the other species is on the other side of the line. There's no overlap of those points, the discrete places. <coughs> And so we wanted to ask the question whether well, two ways this could happen. One is that this is simply a, <coughs> a passive consequence of, of habitat selection. Each bird selects the habitat that suits its needs best. And this one likes forests, and this one likes canebrakes. And uh, you get that spatial separation because um, of different preferences, but it doesn't imply anything that about whether the birds are interacting, but you assume they're not interacting. This is all a passive process. The other, the other alternative is that there's some sort of active um, engagement of the species along that border that is uh, uh, generating the boundary, and it's, in, in, in which case it's an active process rather than the passive one. So we tested that using Playback experience, thank you very much, you're welcome. And so uh, here, here is how these playbacks, when you put a speaker out, you have a tape, you play, put the speaker way over there so the bird doesn't see you, and it's play the tape to a target individual that's singing somewhere in the forest. You put the speaker, you retreat, and then you start to play the tape for two minutes, whatever it was. And so, here is my Therinus, the one of the, the forest living one. You place the song of its, its, its own species uh, to a, a test individual. And um, after you've done that 21 times, you find in 19 out of the 22 cases, uh, the target bird approaches the speaker and acts in an aggressive fashion and comes to sometimes it's very agitated and we'll just go around the speaker, flapping its wings, being very, very excited. Now, um, so that's the normal response. That's the territorial response. It's a bird that's at defending its territory. You challenge it by putting an intruder in the middle of its territory. Yes, it's going to come and defend its territory. Now, you play Leucophrys, the other species, the Myotherinus, and what happens? Ah, mostly it goes away doesn't do that at all. It has been two cases, but in the great majority of cases, statistically very, very clear, 
up. It either stayed where it was or it went farther away. So there's a very opposite kind of reaction. Now, do the same two sets of experiments with new cofries, play it to itself, it behaves in its normal territorial fashion. You play myothorhinus to leucophries, and it responds as if it were hearing its own song. The song's quite different. You never mistake the difference. And uh, so we have, what we have here is a, 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 an asymmetric response. Um, one of the birds is aggressive towards the other. The first is, is passive or submissive towards the other. So it leads to an asymmetry, and uh, that suggests this is uh, the preferred habitat. And this, uh, and the leucophries can occupy it because it can uh, prevent myothorhinus from um, encroaching. Um, the other way doesn't work. And so we, we did this with a whole lot of different genera and different families, a pretty broad collection of species. And sometimes the early successional species was the aggressor, as in this Vermiborus case. Other times it was the forest species. Uh, didn't seem to fall out in a consistent way. But what was consistent was the, the uh, uh, asymmetric responses played these spatially, uh, played playbacks of these spatially non-overlapping uh, species and their, their relatives, uh, we, uh, for in every case, got um, these uh, asymmetric um, responses indicating that the territorial boundaries are maintained by um, aggressive interactions between species. Now, this is, uh, these are examples of what is called interspecific territoriality. Again, it's a, a phenomenon that was considered to be very important in uh, bird communities in general, but here are 35 genera in which we found these kinds of interactions. Some of them have multiple species as well. And so uh, this uh, uh, behavior of interspecific territoriality uh, proved to be a, a very important organizing principle uh, that uh, established the spatial relationships of as many that is 40 percent of all species in the landscape. So it, it wasn't, in fact, a very uh, a very important mechanism. Now, the last thing I'll say is that um, uh, I'm about to go back down there uh, next Tuesday. I'm leaving, and uh, Scott will be coming along a few days after that. Uh, we're going to do another one of these big censuses. It's now, what, 36 years later, and uh, there's some indications that there have been changes in the nature of the community. We don't know that until we do the, do the field work to find out that, um, with global change affecting almost anything we want to measure these days, uh, it seems likely that we may be in some surprises. So um, we'll see. Maybe I'll, Scott or I, somebody. Come back and report on that to you later. So, thank you for your attention.